So if you've been with us for the past couple weeks, we've been talking about Emmaus and Luke 24, the road to Emmaus, and the encounters that we can have with Jesus that nothing aren't visible in our eyes. Remember, they didn't know that was Jesus. That was Jesus intentionally trying to show the church how to have a big shift in their understanding, how to let go of looking for God on a wall or a picture, or what does he really look like? Is he, is he Jewish? Is he a brother? I mean, people have a lot of questions, but I don't think that's an important part of the Bible. I think the real question is, is he working in our lives? How do we pursue Jesus? And last week we talked about the brother's keeper. A brother's keeper, you remember, was the idea that the commandment of God to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. These things hang all laws. And then what was the second aspect? To love our neighbor, right, as ourselves. And so apparently God says these two things are extremely important to him. And I hope that you guys were encouraged and maybe even challenged to go beyond what I feel like what happens in Western society is a very self-centered gather up all you can, like a guy with a money bag. He's kind of just getting everything he can before he goes home. I don't know if God is very pleased with that. And people say, oh, well, that's not the Christian mindset. Friends, I beg to differ. Sometimes there are believers that get caught up in their own needs, and we tend to just leave out our brother and our sisters. I want to encourage you guys again that part of the gospel is to take care of those in need. We studied uh, remember Luke 10, I believe it was a Samaritan. Remember the good Samaritan? The guy that fell amongst thieves. And uh, the, the Levite and the priest is kind of like, mm, I don't want to deal with that. And the good Samaritan was a gentleman that wasn't even Israelite in a sense. It wasn't truly Jewish. He was the one that helped. And Jesus said, you should go and do likewise. It's all up on YouTube there for you guys if you missed that sermon. But we're going to kind of change gears a little bit. I'm going to ask you to do three things tonight before we even dive into tonight's message. Three things I ask. Sometimes when we come to church, we tend to just focus. Okay, that's good. We want to focus. Sometimes we just come and listen. Maybe we're not focused, but we're hearing things. We can hear. Maybe we're not listening and focused at the same time. And then thirdly, I would like us to understand. Is that fair? I want to do three things to do again. I want us to listen, focus, and understand. If you miss one of those three... Tonight's message may not help you as much. I'm going to tell you very frankly, tonight's message is extremely critical, and I'll give you a story of why. I actually had this message planned weeks ago and had drawn up plans in my heart. And in this last week, because I was going to deliver this message this week, I cannot tell you how many, I should say, Lord, encounters or conversations with people that this message is for. It's not like I wrote this sermon, bear with me, I didn't write this sermon to talk to anybody, if that makes sense. I had this sermon written weeks ago, but it just so happened that in this past week, every conversation, every encounter I've had with people, it was like this sermon was that conversation. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It's like God needed to talk about this before I knew that was going to happen. And so I'm, I'm asking you guys, don't just blow by this one. You all have asked me questions in some fashion in your time. I'm telling you this is a sermon for that. Is that fair? So what's the agenda? One more story, and we'll get started. This story is a little bit more lighthearted. There was a construction worker. If you're familiar with the construction world outside in the industrial part of town, they're more hourly workers. They're not necessarily salary guys. Jobs just come and go. Construction guys just kind of go from job to job. And there was a lot of construction going on in this field, and so much so that they said, let's hire a helper. I don't know if you ever heard the term a helper. It's typically a guy that's not technical. He's not a degreed man. He doesn't have a technical certification. He's just a laborer. And so they brought in the young man. Nice guy. And so he joined. And what he would do is just help the technical people do their job. Maybe some painting when the welding's done. Maybe some tool work. Maybe some grinding. Non-skilled labor. Hourly guy. Fairly entry-level job. But what this guy did very interestingly, though, because he did not have any experience in the field and pretty much came from a bad situation, he began to ask everybody that job site methodically a couple questions. What's your job? How much does it pay? And how do you get it? What's your job? How much does it pay? And how do you get that job? And finally, he went into the big boss's office. Now, you the construction guys, especially of the helper, is ever going to go in the main building and go and find this big office, the big boss. He goes into the big boss and looks at him and says, hey, um, how'd you get your job? Seriously, he walked up to the big boss. And asked him, how did you get your job? Well, this shocked people. Like, what are you doing over there? You can't be walking in there. Turns out, 
that construction site began to have layoffs because blood just tightened down, and they began to cut people one by one by one by one. Guess who they kept? The helper. Because the big boss was so shocked that this guy, who had no experience, nothing to do with his plan, walked up to him and said, you want my job? They said, that guy has potential. He had no background, no experience, nothing. But they just said he had what? He had a hunger. Something in him said, this guy is willing to walk right up to the main boss and say, I want your job. How'd you get it? He said, let's get that guy trained. They put him in school. They're training him now. And he's getting multi craft with all sorts of skills. Just because he said one thing, how do I get your job? Does it make sense? Oh, it's a real story. I'm not even exaggerating. It's actually quite amazing. Because what's very funny is when we look at leadership of this world, sometimes we get caught up in what we've done. But sometimes what God is really looking for is what? What's in here. And so tonight's message is actually, if you listen very carefully tonight, is actually, you've got to really check your goals with God. It's really going to check what your heart is. Because all of us can say we've come to the table with something. We can all bring something to God. But what the real challenge is, is what's in here. And what does that look like to God? So tonight's message is spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. Because frankly, Christianity has been diffused into a checklist faith. If that doesn't make sense, I'll, I'll clarify in a minute. When I grew up in church, the reason we're talking about spiritual growth tonight, I was told two things. You need to get saved, you need to get saved, and you need to get saved. And then after a while, they'd be, hey, y'all get baptized. You've been in church for a while. You probably need to get baptized. That was probably the extent of my young walk. And so what happens when I meet people in that environment or that culture is, at some point they'll just say, yeah, I'm saved, or yeah, I got baptized. And it becomes a, I did that, and so I'm going to go what? Right, back to my old life. They'll go right back to the way they were. I'm not saying they're going to go completely to sin, but they have a very kind of standstill lifestyle. They're not very chasing after Jesus, and so we treat the faith of God as a pursuit, not a, hey, by the way, are you saved? And me too. I believe we would have a much different church. And I don't speak about our church. I speak about the greater church here on the West Coast, at least. And so my context is this. What is spiritual growth? Why does it matter? Because spiritual growth matters to God. And it means there's a pursuit that we need to understand it. Y'all okay with me? So why don't we have a lot of questions? This is going to be a series of messages, and I just want to just kind of put a lot on the table. We're not going to finish it tonight, but I want us to grow. I really want this church to grow and understand how to go beyond your circumstances. Let me tell you, friends, spiritual growth is one answer you're missing. Too often when I meet with people, they ask me, why did this happen, or why is this not working, or what is going on? And I can kind of tell you on a very summary level, it's about spiritual growth. It's who we really are with God. If I ask you what it is, what spiritual growth is, or how to measure growth, it'd be hard to define, right? Let me give you an example. If I talk to you about financial growth, if someone said, hey, are you financially growing? You would ask me what? Salary, your savings account, maybe your possessions, whatever. If I ask you about your, maybe you're training in a gym on the weekend, maybe you lift a lot of weights, I'd ask you how that's training going. You'd tell me, hey, I'm lifting more weights, I'm lifting more often this week, I'm stronger. Maybe you're in sports, you're faster, you're quicker, you know, you're in better shape than you were. But if I were to ask you to measure this church's spiritual growth, how would you do that? If God came and asked me, Michael, tell me about the spiritual growth of this church, how would I measure that for you? Is it tangible? It's a hard thing, right? It's a hard thing. See, what happens is we look at churches and we stamp them with the traditional, they meet, they meet here, they go there. Uh, they're this size, it's got this demographic, it's primarily this or that. Is God really interested in your color or your language or your accent? I don't think so. Is God really going to say, well, you're small or big, so you don't have to do as much work as a big guy? I don't think so. I think what God's looking at is here. And so when God asks me about presenting a church to his name, what I really feel like God's going to ask me, honestly, if I'm the shepherd, per se, and I have a responsibility, he's going to ask me what? How is the growth of your church? And then you would say, well, Michael, how do you measure that? So we got a conversation. Is that okay? Is everybody on board with me now? That's going to be a quite a discussion. And I'm not going to sit there and measure one to another. I'm not really interested in saying, oh, superstar here, entry-level person there, veteran. That's not the issue. What I'm asking is, what is the Christian faith supposed to be? 
It's a pursuit. It's a pursuit. So does everybody okay now? Is everybody ready? Are we ready to start this? We're going to have quite some conversations tonight. We're going to deal with a lot of what I consider difficult questions. I mean, I believe there are a lot of questions in the Christian faith when it comes to God, especially when you take Him at His word and things just don't always go so well. And so we're going to deal with a lot of things tonight. So let's open the Bibles together and let's get this show on the road, if you don't mind. What's the first thing we're going to talk about? We're going to start with our friend Jesus Christ, of course, the Lord of all. John chapter 3 starting with verse 1 through 3. John chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, we'll have it up on the screen. If you remember the Gospels, are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're we'll read here together. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot. He cannot see the kingdom of God. You guys are quite familiar with that passage. John chapter 3, everybody is familiar with the salvation story. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know the story, right? But let's just slow down and rewind to just those three verses. Because you're going to find that conversation is actually quite loaded. First thing you might note, is that Jesus gives a very strange answer to a very genuine question, right? He says, Jesus, clearly you're from God because no one can do what you're doing. And Jesus says, you must be born again. Did y'all see that? Everybody okay with that? Everybody with me? Look, here's the deal. Let me just break that down for you a little bit. Can you imagine if you and I go to dinner and uh, you sit down with me and Michael, how was your weekend? You must be born again. I mean, that's the most random answer. I mean, does he really make sense? I mean, it's almost like a Star Wars thing where, you know, Darth Vader comes in and he's like, Luke, uh, you must be born again. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, how does that even tie to his question? I can imagine going through a Chick-fil-A drive-thru. You know, can I get an order for you? I'm like, yeah, you must be born again. It, 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 there's no context. So why is Jesus saying something so randomly? Is everybody okay with that? I mean, I think it's a weird answer. But I believe that as we study this together, you're going to make sense of this. So let's go back to verse 1, and let's not skim past this, because I warn people, when you read Scripture, understand what you just read. Look at this. Read very carefully. Who is Nicodemus? We'll call him Nick for short. Who is Nick? He's a Pharisee and a what? Ruler. Now, he's meeting a guy that is basically a carpenter's son. Do y'all hear that? They don't really think Jesus is God, okay? So he's just a dude. And the Pharisees, in my understanding, would be very royally dressed. They want you to know they're a Pharisee. And here's a guy that was probably living on the streets at this point, walks in, and this guy is supposed to be the king of all kings, in a sense, spiritually. So if you had a theocratic, like a theological ladder, Nicodemus here is at the top, and Jesus doesn't fit anywhere in their chain because it says that he was a Ruler. That means he was high up in his organization. And so he meets with Jesus privately and says, this doesn't make sense. I'm the ruler. You're the carpenter's son. Why are you doing such great miracles? You're just a man. Look at verse 2. But clearly, we know that you're a teacher and you can't do this unless God is with you. So inherently, what he's asking is, Spiritually, you would attain to something. He wants to know. If you don't think they're having a conversation, what time did they meet? Did they meet in broad daylight with some friends at Starbucks? No, they're hiding this conversation. This guy is at the top of his peak, and he's not making it to this guy, and Jesus says, you don't even know where to start. So what is Jesus answering? I'm saying, you got to do what? you got to start over. Everybody catch that? You must be born again. You're going to have to start over. See, at the very foundation of spiritual growth, which is the topic tonight, this is the hardest thing for the church to, to really grasp and receive. If you want to be like Jesus, step one is what? Start over. Think about it. This man has run circles around all of us as far as this Pharisee in his context. If you were to look at the church today, he'd be like an archbishop over all the guys or maybe the elite apostle or whatever term you want to use. 
And he doesn't understand how this guy has grown immensely. Other than God must be with you. Well, does this guy think God isn't with the Pharisees? I mean, when the Pharisees think God's with him, they don't understand how he's doing this. And Jesus gives him a very odd answer. So now does it seem very odd? All he's saying is, you can't ask me about the kingdom. You can't ask me about healing or casting demons out or laying hands or prophesying or walking on water or miracles until we do one thing. We've got to start with step one. Does that make sense? Sometimes we have very zealous believers. And that's a good thing to have zealous believers. And they come see a minister do something very amazing. And they're like, oh my gosh, I would like to do that too. And this guy says, okay, well that's good, but Jesus might tell you, hey, it's probably time to start over. Is that okay? I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I want you to remember something. This was written long before I talked to anybody. This is not a rebuttal to any conversation I've had. It's not personal. But I'm telling you very clearly, God might be talking to somebody saying, hey, hey, hit the brakes. It's time to start from scratch. Is that okay? That might be, I don't know. You know, again. He says you must be born again. So, it's okay. So now we have the foundation of what it takes to be like Jesus. You see what happens with the church? Now, I don't think anybody here is born saved. If you are, congratulations. But for many of us, we had to grow up a little bit. And for many other people, maybe as you matured, you began to really understand your salvation. And inherently what happens is, you bring with you some of your status, and then you come to Jesus. I'll explain. Some of you might say, Michael, you're already a chemical engineer. What does that really mean to Jesus? As part of salvation? Nothing. Somebody's going to say, well, I'm a PhD, and I'm a Pharisee, and I'm also the guy that founded the church, and Jesus looked what I did, and Jesus like, yeah, that doesn't matter to me. Until you, spiritual growth cannot start until you start over with Jesus. That's the biggest heart hit. I'm telling you again, it's the biggest hit for any believer is to recognize that for you to begin to grow in Jesus, God may tell you, hey friends, we're starting back at zero. We're just mistakes. Because too often I see people, here's a straight road, here's just about three degrees off. Not a big deal when you start the three degrees, right? Not a big deal. But in about two years, where am I and where is this guy? So I'll catch that one more time. I have a circle. I have straight zero degrees. I have three degrees off. Not a big deal. A week later, me and you are cool. Two weeks later, you say something funny. Ah, it's cool. Three years later, I'm like, I don't even know you. You're talking strange things. That's why Jesus sometimes comes and tells you, hey, friend, let's come back to zero. Is that okay? Okay. So, let's keep moving on for time's sake. What's the real deal here? Does Jesus play by his own rules? I think so. I believe that when Jesus is teaching Nicodemus that you must be born again, you must start from scratch. I believe that Jesus himself gave us the lifestyle we should follow. So to do that, let's go back a little bit story. Let's go back in time to Luke chapter 2, if you don't mind. We're going to understand how this works. Luke chapter 2, verse 45 through 52. Now we're talking spiritual growth. And God is going to show us in Scripture how we can become like Jesus. Now I mean that in the sense that we should serve God in the fullest extent. <coughs> He's our God, we're his servants. So it reads here. So when they did not find him, let me back up just a little bit. Do you remember the family of Jesus? Jesus is just a young boy at this point. They cruise on over to Jerusalem, and they have the census, and they dedicate him, or whatever, all the stuff, and they come back, and they miss Jesus. I hope everybody remembers that, Luke 2. So the parents have lost Jesus. Why? Because he stuck back. So let's read verse 45. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now it was so that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now remember, he's just a boy. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. Now read this verse carefully. And Jesus what? Increased in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and men. Don't catch the story. Let's just repeat a little bit. The parents take a young Jesus over back to Jerusalem. They have their thing. Jesus hangs around in the temple. And he's talking at a level 
where the Pharisees and Sadducees are astonished that he can ask questions and answer things far beyond them. How old is Jesus, by this way? How old is he? Young, right? 12, 15, something. But not 30. So there is something in Jesus that has clearly grown beyond his age. We're talking spiritual growth, right? If you saw the boy, they said they were what? Go back to the verse. I'll help you, friends. It says here, verse 27, they were astonished at his understanding and answers. Why were they astonished? Because they saw a young boy. Y'all hear me? They saw with their eyes a young boy. So if he were gray-haired or bald, would they be astonished about, oh, man, this guy's a pretty good teacher. But why is a boy outshining men? Because he was one. Growing. Really? I'll help you. Luke 2, go back a few verses, 39 through 40. I'm going to help you with this. We've got a lot to talk about. Luke 2, 39 and 40 says this. This is picking up the same chapter. This is right after they dedicated the baby Jesus after seven days because they had to dedicate the firstborn to the Lord according to the law of Moses. So the parents brought them to the temple. When they performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Now look at this. This is just a baby. And they what? Say it. The child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. I put up verse 51 again. Verse 52 or verse 51, here too. It's 52, I'm sorry. And he increased. How do you increase when you started somewhere? So what do we have? The, the child began to see the strength of God even at such a young age, and then later in his life, he continues to increase. Does everybody see that yet? How do you increase when you have nothing? You know, what did Jesus do even as a young, young child? Go back to verse 40 again. I want you to see this. We're talking spiritual growth, friends. Don't let them remember what I asked you this week. You have to understand, listen, and focus. Otherwise, you're going to miss this. Verse 40. The child grew and became, what's the word? Strong in spirit. A child. Too often in churches, what do you do? You look around, like, hmm, that's a child, that's a girl. Ooh, that person never been in church because they got a tattoo. That guy, he's not dressed nice, he's not wearing a suit. That's what the world does. That's why I said, when you come to me and God were to ask you, how do you measure spiritual growth? You do what? Well, he's got a big Bible. That's a pretty fancy cross around his neck. He, he quoted the verse. He, oh, he quoted the verse number. That's it. He, he's made it. I don't think, friends, that that's how God looks at us. How does this make sense? Uh, the boy Jesus is looking at Scripture and understanding things at a level that people say, how did you do that? How many of you guys want to understand that tonight? How many of you guys want to walk in that level? That's what we're doing. I want this church. I'm not raising children for the rest of my life. No offense. I want to raise up mighty men and God and women. If you miss this message, you say, oh, Michael, that's offensive. Man, you're really going to miss the boss on this. I need you just to kind of put down whatever you've decided that you've achieved with God, and let's just start at zero and grow. Maybe you're already ahead of me. Just bear with the audience, and let's all come together, just like Moses, and let's get out of Egypt. That's what I want to do. I want to believe we can do this together. It says here that the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And you jump back to verse 52. It said he increased. He only increased. Go again to verse 52. Jesus increased of wisdom and stature and the favor with God and men. So, how do we get to that? I want to. I want us to grow and increase. I want us to be strong in the spirit. I do not want to see believers pushed around like trees in the wind with no hope against the powers of evil. I want us to be strong like Jesus. And I believe that this is the answer. The first thing we want to start with, just to recap, Jesus told Nicodemus, Nicodemus said to him, oh, you're definitely the man of God. You do all these signs and wonders. Jesus says, it's very simple. Got to start over. What did Jesus do? From the very day after he was dedicated, he began to understand the word of God. He began to grow in wisdom and stature, and then it only increased as he got older. How many of y'all know that Jesus began his ministry at 30 years old? Y'all know the Bible says 30 years old. That means Jesus was trained for ministry for almost 20 plus years. Sometimes people say, I don't heal like Jesus. No offense, 
not a lot of people do because he trained 20 something years. But I believe that we're going to see something else that's going to encourage you. You don't have to wait 20 years. I'm going to show you how. How many know that you serve the God of increase? Amen. Really? The God of increase. The God of increase. If that's okay, you know, familiar? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6 and 7. We're going to do this together in a minute. I want everybody in this house that loves Jesus to understand your God is a God of increase. You cannot have spiritual growth until you recognize that God is in charge. Look at verse 6. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. Paul writes and says, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters but God who gives the increase. So I'm going to ask again, how many of you know that your God is the God of increase? Amen. Good, excellent. Now we all got that together. My friends, here's the next question. How many of you guys know increase is supernatural? It's okay if you don't have the answer. We're going to get it together. How many of you realize that increase is supernatural? First of all, what is increase? Just what is increase? What does that mean, increase? That's a simple word, but we're talking about spiritual matters. As we begin to serve God, as we begin to read His Word, as we begin to grow, something begins to happen to us and we change. Remember, is it a tangible thing? Can I tell you how much spiritual growth my brother here has? Not really. That's something God does. I'm not in charge of increase. It's something that God is in charge of. So when someone says, what is increase? It's God working inside a man to grow him. Do y'all hear that answer? What is increase in terms of spiritual growth? It's God working in a man to grow him. Because can I see it? Can I, can I show you my spiritual strength? Is it, is it here? Is it my bicep? Is it my running? I don't think so. It's not my, my three-foot chop. Ch it's not that. I can't, it's only God can do that. You say, how do I know that? Would you mind looking at verse 6 very carefully? Who's the one that planted? Paul? Paul, right? Is that a man or God? Man. Who watered? Is that a man? Who gave the increase? God. Tells me something real simple, friends. God uses men to plant. You can plant. God can use people to water. But guess who's in charge of increase? God. You know why it's supernatural? Because it's God's job. Whatever God is doing, salvation, is that supernatural? Can, can I go take the heart of a, a simple man and put in a, a God-loving heart? I can't do heart surgery. Only God can. Can I raise a man from the dead, whether from sin or from actual death? No, but God can. Can I tell cancer to walk out of the man's body? God can. That's my point. If God is in charge of increase, my friends, let me tell you, Increase is supernatural. Is that fair? See, if we water down God's role in our life, you become like Nicodemus saying, Jesus, I'm the Pharisee and I'm the ruler. How do you do those miracles? And Jesus would be shaking his head saying, you don't even know what you're asking me for. You got to start over. You have to see that God is in charge of your growth. Only he can give you the increase. Now, I'm not taking your role out of this. Don't bear with me. Let's going to continue. But God is one who will supernaturally grow you into what you become. I want to show you how increase works. But I want everybody to understand. What is increase again? Is God supernaturally doing something that I can't see or touch? But he's changing me the inside out. So when you say, I want increase like Jesus, what do we read? Luke 2, Luke 2, chapter 40, Luke chapter 2, verse 40 and 52. We saw that Jesus began strong and he only increased. So who was increasing Jesus? God. So can we also walk like that? Can we serve Jesus in a similar fashion? I believe that Jesus gave us a model for what it is to be a Christian. I believe that they included his young life in Luke 2 for us to understand how to be more like him on this earth. To be a bright, shining light. To serve others. To love people the way we love God. And I want to love people just like Jesus, which means... If you've got a problem, I want to fix it right there. I don't want to be like, well, maybe God wants you to suffer. I, I want to show people the power of my God. And I believe that Jesus has given us that understanding. The first thing you realize is God is in charge of increase. So 
So how do we make increase happen? Is there a way? Can we make increase happen? What did you just read? Three things. I must plant, then I must water, and then increase will come. Awesome job, guys. Awesome job. Now, I must plant, I must water, and then it will increase. I must plant, I must water, then it will increase. I'll tell you a quick story. I was with a friend of mine who's actually much into lifting weights, and he was talking about deadlifts and how much he could do. And I didn't know what a deadlift was, frankly. You really with a deadlift. Basically, you just have the weight on the ground, you have a whole lot of weight, and you stand there, and you pick up your knees, clear the weight, and drop it. And this so happened, the guys that were watching were lifting like 800 to 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds. The dude lifts 1,000 pounds. Big old guys whose shoulders are probably twice as wide as mine. But it wasn't the lift that, that really interested me. It wasn't the fact that he lifted 1,000, although that's amazing. You just see what these guys did before they lifted. They were jumping up and down, they were stretching, they were moving their legs, they were turning, they were hitting each other, they were patting, they were grabbing each other, and they were prepping each other. You know what's sad? I think they're more dedicated to their stuff than we are to God sometimes. I'm not trying to spit on the church. I'm just saying, if you took those guys and you took that dedication to lift 1,000 pounds, and you see how energetic and how dedicated and how much of their physical body they would throw at something to pick up that weight. And then we come to faith, it's like, well, I know God. I'm waiting on God. Waiting on God, waiting on God. Nothing's happening, waiting on God. And the other dude's like, why don't you just pick up your weight, dog? Just pick it up. I'm like, oh, that's a lot of weight. He's like, yeah, it is. 800 pounds is a lot of weight. You know what I did? I just trained. I heard another funny story about this whole thing. Y'all know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is, right? You know he's like a multi-guy, multi-town, uh, Mr. Olympia, Mr. Universe? He was like multi-town. He was just one of the top winners ever in the history of that sport. They said they were working out with him at the gym back in his younger days. And it was late at night, and everybody was getting out and going home. He looked at them and said, what are you doing? It's time to get serious. He, he was just shocked, like, how did you leave? The guy's like, it's midnight, dude. We're going home. I think for the church to come serious with spiritual growth, you really got to decide, how big do I want to be? I'm a guy, okay, bear with the analogy. I mean, how big do you want to be? Do you just want to be a lightweight? And every time some bully comes over, the spiritual bully of fever or sickness or job loss or trouble or whatever else and tragedy, like, ah, oh, yes, I'm going to just sing. It's well with my soul. I believe that Jesus gives us victory over these things. If you remember, as well is actually a reference from Elijah when she lost her son. Do you know why she said it was well? Because she thought the man of God's going to raise her son. That's why she said it's well. Slap track. Let's go back to this. Here's the deal. God wants us to increase. We want to grow. And we want to follow the three steps. Planting, watering, and increase. Now friends, I'm telling you. You see these guys lift weight. They're a lot more alert than us. I'm just saying. What is planting? Mean? What is planting? Planting is one of the most favorite analogies from Jesus. If you've ever studied the Gospels. You'll see that in those four Gospels, he loves that farming analogy more than anything. He really talks about planting and watering and seeds and harvest and all this stuff. So he tells a story in Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, I believe. We're not going to read it just yet. But he basically tells us what it is to plant. And he tells us about the parable of the sower. Do you remember that? He said there were seeds. There were seeds that were spread around on the wayside, on the stony ground, on the place where it got choked up, and then the good soil. Does everybody kind of remember the parable of the sower? And who was the sower? Jesus. And what was he sowing? The Word of God. Is that right? So when he talks about planting, what is the Bible really saying? What are you planting in your soul? The Word of God. Is that not true? Are you not planting the Word of God? Look again at Mark chapter 4. 13 through 14. Let me help you guys. I see some blank skins. Write this in your notes if you're saying, I don't know what you just said. Please put in your notes. Mark 4, 1 through 9, the parable of the sower. Now, for the time's sake, we're going to go to the question. The disciples ask Jesus, what do you mean? What is this old parable? What's this whole sowing story? What's up with the farming? Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? If you don't understand this, how will you understand all parables? So go to verse 14. 
The sower sows the word. So when we talk about planting, when we talk about chasing after Jesus, the first thing to get increase from God is we must plant the holy word of God in us. Now Paul says he planted in the people in Corinth, but you can plant in yourself, and you can plant in others. Is everybody okay? The word of God must be planted in your soul. I'm going to ask you this, friends. And I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not even asking you to stand up and ask me. But if I were to ask you, how much of the word of God is planted in your soul? 50? 25? 75? Or that one. How much of the word of God is planted in your soul? That's your choice. For spiritual growth to increase, you have a say by that, do you not? Was Paul a man? Are you human? Sounds like you got a job to plant. So I want to see the increase of God. I've got a responsibility. Sounds like to get over there, I've got to start walking like this. I need to start walking over to my goal. To serve God greatly, I must plant the Word of God. I've told you many times, there is no secret to serving God other than the Word of God. There's just no other better route. You can chase after all these anointings and miracles. Great, great, great. But they're going to point you back to Jesus. That's all they're going to do. And if you shortchange yourself, man, I'm sorry, friends. You're just, if you miss the Bible, you're just, you're just missing the biggest chain that's going to hold all this together. And you're going to get lost. You're going to get caught up in bad doctrine. And you won't know your way around. Jesus told them very clearly, you must understand the Word of God. So what is planting again? The Word of God inside our soul. Now, as you word this again, I'll remind you, some of us don't necessarily plant the Word of God in good ground. That means that we should always be careful to read with a focus, with an understanding, with a purpose. Don't just read to read. Too often we find people that read the Bible for just the sake of saying, yeah, I read that. I read Samuel. I read Joseph. I read about uh, Luke. But then you don't even know who's who. And if somebody brings it up, you kind of nod, and then you silently you're in your mind, you're thinking, what are they saying? All of us should be accountable to our own understanding of the Word of God. You can't say, but he said, or I got a good sermon on that, or I know a friend that can help you. Why don't you be the person that represents Jesus in the friend's life? I'll say it again. Why don't you be the person that represents Jesus the most in your life? Not your pastor, not your best friend, not your favorite YouTube link. You should be the one that represents Jesus the most. I'm sorry, that's the truth. Next step. Water. What is water? Remember, we're talking about what are the three steps? We must plant, we must water, and then God will give the increase and we can grow as a church. What is water? <coughs> Friends, I don't know if you've ever seen my backyard, but it's kind of rough some days. And there was a season in which my wife and I decided to buy a bunch of trees and pots and plants and things. All kinds of fruits. Now, they didn't get to see a lot of water. They're there, but you won't find them. You might see some dead branches, some empty pots, and some decayed pot. I mean, like, literally, it's just bad. What did we neglect to do? We never watered them. They were in the backyard, out of sight, out of mind, and slowly there goes all that money. But it's okay. I was, it's a good serving point. We, we don't go back to what we read, and we do not water what we read, does it have any effect? Is there any fruit? Someone tells me, yeah, I read Isaiah. Oh, you did? When did you do that? Oh, back in 2006, there was a big revival, and I read Isaiah. It's 2017. Maybe you don't remember it as well anymore. Somebody says, yeah, I used to read the Bible all the time. I'm like, if the word starts with used to, or I remember that from years ago, you probably aren't watering your plants, and they're probably dead. I'm just saying. That's why Jesus specifically says you must what? Water the plant. You must water the seed. If you will not refresh the word of God in your soul, why do you expect it to do anything? I can't tell you how many times I had a very severe trial in my life. And after asking God, saying, tell me the answer, you know what his three words were? You know what his three words were to me? Read it again. That was it. You know, oh, you hear from God. Oh, well, it must be easy. Oh, really? It's usually, hey, read it again. You didn't read it properly. I had to rewater 
everything I'm doing. I have to consistently water the Word of God. That means I must, it's a lifestyle. It's a pursuit. I cannot just say a checkbox. Yes, I read the Bible. Congratulations. Now I'm going to go back to TV. No, friends. You must water your plants, your seeds, the work of God in life. If you do not, you will even lose what you have. Here's the best part. Jesus said something very unique. Do you remember this? God said to us in John chapter 4, verse 10, He says, I'll give you some water. People say, well, this is all supernatural talk, right? This is all spiritual talk. John chapter 4, verse 10, there's a conversation between the Samaritan woman at the well, and He said to her, bring me some water. What does Jesus answer? She's like, oh, you don't have water. So he, said, he said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you what? Living water. That makes us a lot more alive, doesn't it? It's not just a book, friends. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to discern between soul and spirit. Living water. You say, friends, I'm studying the Word of God. It's dry. I'm in a dry season. These things are not having an impact on my life. Friends, the Bible says, if you knew the what? Gift. How do you receive a gift? You just put your hands out and say, Lord, I'm ready. Give me this gift. I want more of the living water. I want to understand what it is you're giving me. Tell me about this gift of the living water. Go back to 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. I'll help you. We've studied this many times. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10 tells me that eye has not seen nor ear heard nor entered the heart the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to through His Spirit. God has revealed the things of God to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, even the deep things of God. So, Michael, I'm not... Okay, good. So the Spirit's helping me? Yeah. Good. Now go to John 16, 12 and 13. John 16, 12 and 13 tells me, Jesus says, I have many things to say to you, but you can't even bear them. But don't worry. When He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. So what does living water do? It waters the Word of God so that I can understand. Is that a simple formula? So we have planting. Who's the one planting? Jesus. Who's the one who waters? The Holy Spirit. So guess whose turn is the increase? God. One more time. Jesus taught the Word of God as a human being to people. It's in the Gospels. A man named Jesus Christ. He said, if you ask me, I'll give you the gift of living water. It will water what I taught you so that you can understand. Now, if I plant and I am watered, what has to happen? Ah, perfect. Go with me to Mark chapter 4. What did I say increase is? Increase is what? Super? Natural. Think about it. Increase the supernatural. We're going to talk about the supernatural power of God to increase. Mark 4, 26 to 29. Stay with me, guys. Let's come on. We've got to stay sharp with this. And he said, this is Jesus teaching, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter his seed on the ground, and he should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. Stop there. Put those two verses up. 27, 29. You've got to see this. Jesus said, the gospel seed, the kingdom seed of God, is as if a man should scatter, there's that word, seed, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed, what? Begins to sprout and grow, and he himself does not know how. There's an increase discussion here. God's about to teach you on the power of increase. Now go to the next verse so we understand the other. 28. For the earth yields crops by itself, First the blade, then the head, after that the full grain of the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts a sickle, because the harvest has come. Tell me something, friends. Who are you in that story? Verse 28. You're designed to receive seed, so you are the what? You are you? The earth. It said the earth is ready to receive seed, and then it begins to grow a blade, and it begins to become a grain. But Jesus is talking about sowing the word into who? 
us. So he said it, it is like the earth. So who is the earth? We are the ones who receive the teaching of God. And it says we go to sleep, but we don't know how it's changing. How do I measure spiritual growth? I can't see it, friends. You can't tell me Michael's any bigger after doing the sermon, but you can bet I got bigger during the sermon. Do y'all see that? You can believe that as you study the Word of God and you begin to make an understanding and you teach the Word of God, something's happening. You don't know why it is. Jesus said, let me teach you the power of increase. It's like a farmer who plants seed. And as he goes to bed, he gets up. He's like, hey, it's bigger. Do y'all see that? I hope you understand increase. Increase is supernatural. It says the earth yields crop by itself. Why? Who designed the earth? God. Who designed you? God. He made you to increase. God has designed you for this. As the earth is a figure, a parable, to receive a, a crop, to receive a seed, and mature and it blooms. Can I plant seeds in this pew? Maybe. I don't know how you're going to do it. It would be pretty hard. But if I plant seeds in the ground, it grows. Can I plant the Word of God into a dead man? No, but if I plant the Word of God in a believer, the child of God, it will increase. That's the supernatural part. Do y'all see that? You were designed that way. You were made to receive the Word of God. When I meet people that say they do not read the Word of God, friend, you are starving yourself. Matthew 4, verse 4. Man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus told the devil that. I said, you have no business in me. Children of God, we have got to learn what it is to grow <coughs> in the eyes of Jesus. And God is teaching us the word of God is the foundation of every one of our lives. But then he said the gift of God is a spirit so it can reveal to us his word. And then something happens. As we receive the Word of God, as the Holy Spirit reveals it to us, something changes, and suddenly, I've grown. I'm bigger than I was. I'm stronger than what I was the day before. You know what 2 Corinthians 4? It says the flesh wastes away, but the Spirit is renewed day by day. Every day in the Spirit, I am growing stronger. Let me tell you again, friends. Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. But the spirit is life, and the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus said, this is the answer to every need. This is the answer to your needs. The word of God must grow in you. You must grow in strength. We're almost done, friends. I want you to see something very clearly. What happens when growth is ready? What's that last part? Immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Friends, if you don't know what harvest means, I want you to listen to me very carefully. What does it mean to harvest the word of God? What was the picture Jesus gave you? He said, I'm a farmer. I've labored, I've labored, I've, I've, I've matured the ground, I've cultivated it, I opened it up, I planted good soil, I put the word of God in there, I've watered it with the spirit, it's growing. Do I just go back and say, hmm, that's a good teaching. That was a good sermon. I enjoyed that. What does Jesus say you should do now? I must take it. Do you hear me? I must harvest that for me. I must receive the word of God in me. I see the full grown grain. I must take this in. How to, are you confused? It's okay. I'll give you another answer. 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2, 6 and 7. 2 Timothy 2, verse 6 says what? The hardworking farmer must be First, to partake of the crops, verse 7, consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. When we are plowing, when we are seeking the word of God, when we are planting, when we are watering with the Holy Spirit, at some point, this teaching comes alive. And I, I need to take it. So, Michael, I don't understand. I'm going to help you really quickly. We're going to try to wrap things up, but I want to help you. Let's say you've been a part of a church like this and you begin to hear a lot of understanding, a lot of new things. And you say, I want to operate in a, something like authority. You say, I want to operate in authority. I want to have my spiritual growth in authority. Good. I begin to gather seeds, words of God, salvation seeds that teach me about the authority I have in the name of Jesus. 
I began to plant them as I study the Word of God. I plant those seeds of authority into my soul. And I say, Holy Spirit, bring those seeds to life. And I begin to see the power of God changing my understanding. I say, I understand, Matthew 8. I know what the centurion meant. I know why he told the, the lepers to walk off and not come back. I understand that Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth belongs to me. And as that understanding begins to touch your soul, you know what just happened? The harvest is ready. You say, thank you, Jesus. I receive that. You can't say Too often we say, oh, that makes sense. Okay, great. Oh, wow, this is a good teaching. Okay, great. Why do you think we pray at the end? Do you ever think about why we pray at the end? Do we just do it for routine? Am I just praying to close it out and to send you all home? We're going to harvest what we just want. How many understand me now? I hope you understand. We must understand. When we have been laboring the Word of God and the Spirit of God is explaining this to us, by then a sermon, we should be ready for the harvest. That's why people get healed in the sermons. You think about that. That's why breakthrough happens in the sermons. That's why people see revelation during a sermon. That is a harvest that you say, God has given me the increase. And now I know that I'm ready to serve Jesus. I praise God for that. Amen. I praise God for that. Not me. I praise God for that. Psalm 115, verse 14 and 15. Write this down for your family. Psalm 115, 14 and 15. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. Verse 14, one more time. What is God doing? Who's he talking to? Yeah. Three things he gave you. Did you see three? God gave you increase. More and more. God doesn't want you to stop growing, friends. There is no end goal for me until I see Jesus face to face. I don't know any other way. I don't know another way to live anymore. All I know is I must pursue the majesty of Christ. I must serve him to the end of my days until we meet face to face. That's it. That's all I know. And God will only increase me. You know what the best part is? It passes to my children. You tell me, friends. Do Steve Jobs' kids really hurt? No. Bill Gates' children? No. The children of a most high God? We should not suffer. <coughs> we should be blessed richly. Verse 15, this is why. Verse 15 tells us that we be counted... Blessed by the Lord who made the heaven and earth. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. Why he saying that? He said, God, I designed it that way. I designed you for increase. I designed heaven to grow. I designed earth to receive these seeds. Friends, we have a lot to talk about in this next coming weeks. I hope you guys have just a bigger picture of growth. I hope you have a bigger picture of understanding. I want us to stand up and just proclaim one verse for ourselves. 1 Thessalonians 3. Let's stand up together. I just want you to put one more verse in your spirit. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13. May the Lord make who? Make you increase. And may the Lord make you, say it together with me. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another just as we do to you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What did I say at the beginning of the service? I know it feels a while back. We journeyed quite a bit. I said, God asked me, how do you present a church to God? There. I will pray for each of us to increase and abound in love to whom? Each other. Because the commandments are to serve God and to love one another so that we may be established where? Outwardly like Pharisees and rulers? And braggarts, the heart has to be established. Blameless in holiness, which is perfection before God. Why? Because when Jesus comes home to us, we'll be ready. That's how you prepare a church. That's how you present people to God. Let's go into prayer.